This is the Anarchist War Journal entry number three. I'm going to continue with the next entry I had at the International Students for Liberty Conference in Washington, D.C. Downstairs underneath the hotel lobby, you're going to find lots of tabling going on there, representing many of the organizations that uh, claim to be for the free market, that claim to be for, uh, for capitalism, right, for freedom. And so... Part of the reason I was there as well was to see where exactly some of these representatives, some of these organizations actually lie. Are they for freedom or are they for slavery? Right? For me, there's nothing in between. There's no either or. There's no gray area position in the middle there. Right? You either respect private property or you don't. <laughs> right? You either see the free market as something to always uphold and virtuous to protect and to advocate for or you don't. Right? There's no middle ground in between there. And and not so much it's uh, a war that has been uh, pushed upon us by the state. Right? The state initiated that war on, on peaceful people. It's also a war on words. It's a war that the state has done uh, great injustice to the human mind and the capacity to separate abstract and concrete concepts. Right. Government's always going to tell you that it's wrong for you to steal, but we'll call it taxes, right? To view something else in a different, uh, distracting manner, more like um, uh, like the social contract. All right? It's very difficult to pin them down on what is the social contract. Right? It varies from textbook to textbook. And of course, it doesn't exist. Right? You can't show it to me. It's not something tangible. It's not something real. It's not something you can show me explicit consent. No factual evidence exists to show me otherwise of a contractual relationship with government. None. So, given that context, uh, I felt it was uh, important then to go around and talk to these people and find out where, how they define what is a free market and continue from there, right? So, pretty much the same questions that I asked uh, Jeffrey Tucker are generally the same kind of questions I'm going to be asking many of the people who are attending this conference. Uh, somewhat, sometimes tailoring specific ones to them, and for this instance with reason, um, one particular area that I'm going to cater uh, these browser questions are the interesting piece that they put out not that long ago in February uh, 25th. They posted on Facebook that there is a libertarian case for Bernie Sanders. And it's one sentence long. So libertarian case for Bernie Sanders. I don't know where you can come or draw such conclusions from uh, or see a pattern in there. Uh, to even present or even uh, um, think that something like that could be just the case, right? And so that's something that kind of bothered me. Right? I've been a fan of Reason.com for Reason Magazine for quite a long time, for nearly a decade, and it's helped me a lot um, back then uh, when I was uh, you know, in college and writing a lot of uh, papers against the criminal justice system for college. And so they've been a good source of uh, information out there. Uh, in terms of that, but it always uh, bothers me when the areas in which they seem to advocate for further free market is always kind of juxtaposed with a lot of exceptions, uh, compromises, uh, areas that uh, go against what is the free market. And so I happen to run into uh, Nick Gillespie from Reason.com, the editor-in-chief of uh, of the place. So it was great because I just saw him uh, passing out. My friend Phil spotted him and we managed to get an interview. So let's watch that and tell me what you think. Um, so yeah, I've been a follower reader of uh, Reason.com for right. like over a decade great. myself. Um, I guess in terms of it's like catchphrase, right? Free markets, free minds. Free minds, free, free markets. Free minds, free yes. markets. Uh, how would you define then uh, what is a free market? Uh, a free market is any kind of arena that is set up of uh, voluntary exchange, actually. And, uh, you know, a lot of free markets, uh, you know, they end up getting defined by the participants. Uh, sometimes it's imposed from without. Most of the time, I think the rules of a market or of exchange uh, kind of generate uh, constantly from the, the people who are involved in it. All right. Yeah. And would you say today that we have a free market? Um, I think we have more, uh, some free markets and some unfree markets. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about, like, if we're talking about America as a, as a whole, uh, there, we, are, we have a private enterprise system and we have a free market system insofar as that people have private property and that they are more or less allowed to trade uh, pretty freely. But, you know, depending on the market, 
uh, you know, in the illegal drug market, right. everything is, you know, there are no rules, right, other than what happens at the moment. In banking or real estate or something, there are these all sorts of, you know, an enormous amount of rules. So it really varies, but the question is, can people, can people exchange? I have something that you want, you have something that I want, can we, can we come together and meet a trade? And yeah, we can. Respect for private property, right? And yeah. voluntary exchange. Mm -hmm. I guess in these areas, though, in uh, areas of free market, though, uh, I find it would be difficult to find a free market when there is a uh, taxation, right? Or eminent domain yeah. says, whenever we feel like it, that's our land. Yeah. That's not your house with property right. taxes. Uh, I guess you can't really have complete full ownership. No, but, uh, you know, this is, I, I mean, I'm a small L libertarian, and what, you know, Reason Magazine, which was started in 68, Reason.com, which started in 1994. Reason TV 2007. They're all, we're all like small old libertarian organizations. And we're not, or I'm not a utopian. I'm not a utopian either, right? I want there to be problems. I want there to be a market, a myriad of solutions, a nonviolent ways that we can come across and continue to upgrade, to continue to find uh, better ways to examine problems in our society, uh, to better uh, provide efficient ways to meet your needs, right? That's what the market does, right? The market competition, right? So yeah, not a utopian either. I would say the people who advocate for government are utopian because they believe that just the right amount of government regulation, just the right amount of government intrusion and violation of your consent would create the perfect uh, balance for government tyranny, right? That's utopian to think that you can control and constrain the size of government. So I'm not looking for that perfect platonic free market. What I'm looking for is, you know, people want to trade. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is part of, I won't say it's part of human nature, but it's part of human experience. You know, we're, we want to change and, uh, you know, and, and most trades, if they're voluntary, it's like after the trade, you're better off than you were before. And so am I. And, you know, we, it's win-win. Um, and the question is, can we do that? And, yeah, we can in a lot of different places. Yeah. yeah. And when you look, I mean, there's no question there's tax taxes. I don't think that all taxation is theft. Ah, whoa, what? <laughs> Not all taxation is theft? Um, of what part is uh, being threatened at gunpoint to demand that you surrender your property not theft, right? Of what various degrees is that not theft? All right, if you see that one person of taxation is that we must universally see all of it to be the same, or right? you can't make exceptions here, right? Not all taxation is theft. I think most of it is, or, or if it's not theft, it's a protection racket, right. and we're never going to be able to get rid of it fully, and then the question is, is there a way to keep uh, taxation and other kinds of impositions of third parties? Uh, down to a minimum where it doesn't screw up our ability. Like, I've got a bunch of Star Wars collectibles, you've got a bunch of excess cash. We want to trade these on eBay, say, right. or in, you know, in the parking lot after the show or something. Are there various ways we can do that where, you know, in order for me to give you $100 worth of Star Wars collectibles and you to give me $100 worth of money, we don't each have to cough up $50 to a third party. Right, yeah, yeah. remove third-party interests are not involved in the, inter right. the interaction. Uh, but you would therefore say that taxation is, is not voluntary, right? You mentioned uh, earlier it's yeah, a no, protection well, racket. Mean, yeah, yeah, no, I, and I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I, I'm not, it, it, it's just that I'm not particularly interested in uh, kind of foundationalist arguments about taxation, about, uh, you know, this is a perfect right, I'm, I'm not talking about strategy yeah. or yeah, yeah. how to get rid of yeah. it, but just like calling things out for what they are, right? Yeah. A uh, state-controlled market in which doesn't respect private property, and yeah. a free market that does, right? Yeah. Voluntary exchange. Sure. And the government interactions uh, with the individual is never uh, in terms of contract. There's no voluntary exchange. There's no consideration. Yeah. Well, there is in the sense, I guess, of, and I'm not sure where you're going with it, but I mean, there is in the sense of, like, at least on a certain level, like, let's say uh, your local town introduces a sales tax. Uh, you know, and in most, most places in America, there is a state level sales tax, there might be a county level sales right. tax, and then a local municipality sales tax. You might move from that municipality and say, you know what, like, I don't like what you're doing here, so I'm going to move somewhere else. Um, or I'm going to stay here, and I understand that part of the terms of me, you know, getting on with my life is that I'm going to be paying a 1% cut on every, on every transaction that I make within this town. I'm not saying it's a good thing. Well, uh, and that's yeah. the only part, of, so, yeah, right. Yeah. At least we acknowledge okay. that it's not a good thing, right? Yeah. 
like uh, for like the taxes go to these uh, government monopolized services in mm -hmm. which we don't have the economic freedom to yeah. cancel and subscribe if we could, yeah. right? Uh, and you know what's great though is that in a lot of uh, in a lot of cases we are getting that more and more, and so um, in uh, you know, and it's interesting to think about where does that come from, but. In most parts of the country now, you can choose from different, uh, among competing, uh, say, uh, uh, providers of, of uh, natural gas for heating, uh, for electricity, for cable, or internet, or things like that. So we are getting some more competition. Yeah, some more, right? Like yeah. uh, Dominion Power, so state granted monopoly, right. doesn't allow uh, the economic freedom to compete yeah. against no, which is bad. Yeah. But then I, I live part time in Ohio. And there, I can actually choose from a bunch of different electricity providers um, in in the same town. Or when you think of something like Uber, and this is actually, I'm not sure if I'm moving towards uh, what you're interested in talking about or not, but like something like Uber, you know, we're in Washington D.C. There is a uh, city monopoly on taxis. You know, the the city gets to certify who gets to drive a taxi. There's a couple of different taxi owners. Yeah. But you know, then Uber comes in and says, like, you know what? Uh, we don't we don't care about that. Yeah. So challenging that, that uh, yeah. cartel yeah. monopoly that yeah. the taxi cabs. And I think that with. that's always good. I mean, I don't think that uh, you know, I think monopolies are bad, um, and and also that monopolies really only exist most of the time when when states, city states, or federal governments enforce them. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Like uh, USPS, it's illegal and criminal right. for. Uh, FedEx, uh, UPS, or DHL to compete in the right. market to deliver pieces of paper, right. first class uh, mail, right? or like technically what's considered first class mail, a first class letter. What is interesting about that too is then not only do you have the competing package delivery services, like you mentioned, you know, UPS, FedEx, uh, you can throw in DHL and a bunch of other things, but then the greatest thing is like nobody sends mail anymore, right? We use the internet, uh, and before that it had been fax machines. Uh, if you go back to the 90s when I started getting into the game of uh, political reporting, people were always talking about libertarians who hate the post office because it was a government, you know, the ultimate government granted mon exclusive monopoly on certain types of uh, information sharing. Right. You know, when the fax machine became available and cheap enough so that like everybody could have one and you could just hook it up to your own phone line, the post office was like, oh, this is nuts. We should have a tax on faxes right. because they're eating into our monopoly. And now nobody even has fax machines anymore. So technology, uh, possibly more than uh, even uh, kind of ideology, you know, disrupts monopolies. Right. Would and, you say and state power? Yeah. Would you say like Lysander Spooner will finally uh, cheer when the abolishment of that monopoly yeah. is ended? Right. So Lysander Spooner is one of the original champions of liberty back then. This guy saw the state a hundred years ago for what it was, an organization ran by thieves and murderers, by and for thieves and murderers. And so back then he, he challenged the post office. Back then the post office had an exclusive monopoly, but he, one that in which he did not see in the Constitution, right? So he challenged that monopoly. Back then it cost like $2.50 to mail a partial letter, and he created his own company, the American Letter Mail Company, and did it faster, cheaper, more efficient than, than the government version. And as a result, government eventually sued him out of business. Congress passed a law the next year that says, all right, we're not dealing with that again. No one is allowed to compete with USPS. And that entails the monopoly on first class mail and delivering pieces of paper. And no one in the market is allowed to compete unless they want to become uh, branded as a criminal under the government. And so I have a great video introduction of uh, Lysander Spooner and, of course, what is the USPS and their monopoly that uh, my friend Panzer and I put together. I'll put that in the I guess, note link up above here in a second. And, yeah, check that out. Uh, I, I, you know, it is, it's funny because it's just like, I mean, when you think about the post office, the only issue now I think that people have about the post office is it does, you know, it has this extensive network that is taxpayer supported. The, the, the way that the post office talks about itself, it's that it's, uh, you know, it's self-funding, et cetera, but that's not really true. And it has a bunch of government granted advantages, right. but there's these huge legacy costs that we are all still paying for, even though very few of us rely on anything super important coming from the post office. And, and this is the real question of like, we don't even have to get, and again, I'm not a utopian, uh, but it's like whatever, whatever purpose the post office served in the past, it no longer serves that function now, but we have built this infrastructure 
uh, you know, that is massively expensive in terms of, you know, pensions and in terms of uh, procedures and employees that we're still kind of paying for even though it's no longer, it no longer makes any sense. And that's an interesting transition question because technology has rendered, uh, technology and business innovation has rendered most of the reason for the post office to exist to be moot. Yeah. And yet we're still paying for it. Right. They're yeah. not a real business. They can't allocate yeah. efficient, uh, resources and, efficiently. And by the way, the post, uh, Postmaster General, uh, this was within the past couple of years, you know, he was like, hey, I want to uh, I want to get rid of a bunch of post offices. I want to get rid of a bunch of post offices. And I also want to uh, get rid of Saturday delivery. It's ridiculous. And Congress was like, there's no way you're doing that because my constituents will bitch and moan about it. Right. And so Congress doesn't really have to deal with all of the problems that it creates by regulating the post office in a particular way. So it's, you know, the, the best thing you could do would be to spin it off completely and just say, uh, you know what, you're going to be competing. And you've got yeah. certain advantages. You've got, you've got great market penetration. You've got a great, uh, uh, to a certain degree, you've got a great brand name. And you're gonna, we're going to spin you off and you're going to compete against FedEx and UPS. Right. Uh, or anyone who wants to wants to compete in the market. Exactly. At yeah. least the disadvantages would be uh, many of them have removed the clocks from the side of the post office. So you don't know how long you've been waiting in line, That's right? right? Yeah. Uh, so that would be their disadvantage. And, the, and but. the post office is better than it used to be. Um, you know, but it's uh, so like, you know, this is uh, to, to go to these questions of like, where do practices and where do innovations come from? Uh, you know, we might think about it in terms of banking, and, you know, there were banker's hours, uh, which nobody even knows what that means anymore, but up through some point in the 1980s, banks were only open from about 9 to 3, 5 days a week. They would shut down early on Wednesdays. They didn't have Saturday hours. Hmm. And now no bank is like that for two reasons. One is because technology automated stuff, so you can do online banking 24-7. And then most banks were like, you know what, we realized that our customers were in a service industry and most of our customers are working. So like we're going to have a couple of late nights or, and we're going to open up on the weekends and things like that. And that that's actually where kind of change and progress and innovation comes from. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I guess I have last three more sure. questions. Um, okay. How would you find uh, what is libertarianism then? I think libertarianism is a, uh, you know, it, it's a, sometimes called classical liberalism and it comes out of a political... Uh, philosophy and a kind of uh, understanding that the individual should have more uh, more rights and more responsibilities on the choices that matter in their lives and it's you know it's a, it's a philosophy of individualism uh, and it, it believes that you know I own myself I am responsible for myself I own the fruits of my labor and that you know things like uh, respect for the you know, rule of law uh, respect for private property and the ability to freely enter into all sorts of exchanges are a good thing. I mean, you know, and a reason we call it free minds and free markets. It's right. like you should be allowed to th live how you want to the greatest degree possible. So that would be, I guess, uh, kind of follow like the non-aggression principle, right? In terms yeah, of certainly. Respect yeah. for private property yeah, yeah. Uh, against the initiation of force. That's right. right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I guess you would say libertarian would be someone who advocates against the initiation of force. Absolutely. Respect for private yeah. property. I guess my last question then from there would be, I know you didn't write this, uh, uh, I guess, essay on Reason.com, but someone wrote one in which, like, Bernie Sanders is a libertarian or the no, most what, libertarian. No, what, what, what it actually said, because and I, uh, a couple of weeks ago I wrote one like, is there a libertarian case for Bernie Sanders, uh, question mark, and I said, not that I've seen. Okay. Um, but then there was also one, the libertarian case for Bernie Sanders in one chart, which was a chart that showed all of the different uh, major, you know, Democratic and Republican candidates and their views on foreign policy or on foreign interventions recently. And Sanders was the only one who basically had said no to every major foreign policy intervention that we've had in the 21st century. Um, and in that sense, he, he is not in any way, shape, or form a libertarian. Uh, he's a, you know, by his own uh, admission, he's a social democrat, and he believes that the government should have more control right. over all sorts of business practices, all sorts of speech practices. I mean, the thing that is worse to me about Bernie Sanders is that he, you know, he believes that uh, elections and political speech should be regulated and paid for by the government, which I find as appalling as the idea that uh, religious speech should be, uh, you know, regulated and paid for by the government. You know, no, the, these are things that the government should have nothing to do with. But uh, more to the point that Bernie Sanders is non-interventionist generally in terms of foreign policy, which accords with most libertarians. I libertarians, guess in, in that aspect of it, yeah, yeah. You know, because going back to the non-aggression principle, 
it is the idea that, like, you know, if, if the United States is attacked, we have every right to defend ourselves and to push back as much as we need to in, in order to secure the safety of our, of our people and our people's property. Like any free society, yes, exactly. we have security yeah, you, right. you have a right to defend yourself against, you know, aggression. Right. Um, you don't necessarily have the right to, uh, you know, to initiate that right. aggression. And certainly, when we're looking at things like the Iraq War, when you're looking at the way that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, went into Libya, a variety of other places, we're conducting drone operations where we're killing people in countries that we're not even officially declared war against, or not even necessarily part of the global war on terror. We got a big problem. Right. So, so the really, I don't think there is a libertarian case for Bernie Sanders, but to the extent, if you say, where is he kind of libertarian, uh, or where does he line up with libertarians that's on foreign policy, with the exception of Rand Paul, who's no longer running, right. out of the major party candidates, and this is leaving aside all of the good people in the libertarian party, um, you know, Rand Paul was the only one who called kind of bullshit on, like, the status quo of American foreign policy, which is that America, because America is the greatest country in the world, the most powerful country, we spend more than 40% of all spending on armaments. Uh, we have the biggest army, the most powerful army, all of the weapons and stuff like that. There is an argument of, you know, just saying, well, we can do whatever we want. That's not a good strategy, either from a position of, like, national interest. I mean, we're not better off after being in the middle, you know, after being in Iraq for 15 years or Afghanistan for 15 years. Um, but it's also not a good place from a philosophical position. Right. Um, I guess my last point in, in that contention was uh, what then, I know he didn't authorize or, you know, enter a, a vote of yay towards uh, the initiation of yeah. force of that work, but he did authorize and put a yay for the funding of the murder of a uh, thousands of people overseas in yeah. Afghanistan. I, and that I, I actually, I'm not sure about, like, all of the votes, et cetera. And, you know, this uh, there's also a question of, um, you know, the, the United States, I think, had a, a legitimate warrant from libertarian principles, uh, including non-aggression principle, to go into Afghanistan after we, you know, had very good information that Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda, who were responsible for 9-11, were residing there. Um, I don't think that meant that we should still be in Afghanistan, and in fact, you know, we'll, we'll be there after Obama's out of office and beyond. But, and I don't know exactly where Bernie Sanders was. But one of the things that is interesting, libertarianism, you know, which is a philosophy of individualism and limited government. Whoa! Stop right there. He just told me earlier that libertarianism was uh, follows the non-aggression principle, right? That we're against the initiation of force. That we're for respect for private property, right? Didn't say anywhere in there that sometimes we're against the initiation of force, that sometimes the initiation of force is allowable, is acceptable, as long as it's limited in whatever arbitrary way you want to measure that, right? That doesn't kind of follow through with the definition you just gave me that you just accepted and provided, right? You said that is respect for private property. <laughs> that has to be universally applied. Otherwise, you become a thief. Right? If you have no respect for private property and you take and you violate consent, there's no voluntary exchange in, in those uh, situations. So, libertarianism, in which the way you define it is wherever there is respect for private property, wherever there is voluntary exchange, and wherever there is an absence of that or the opposite, a violation of private property, a violation of that consent between those parties who want to exchange and trade goods with. You do not find libertarianism. That is statism, right? I don't know where you get the limited part from. It's... You know, strictly limited government where people should be given as much uh, freedom and, and space to live their lives the way they want um, is growing in America. It's growing because people have tried everything else and they know it doesn't work and that libertarianism is predicated upon upon things like voluntary exchange and local communities right. and also and technological innovation. People recognize every time they go to Airbnb, every time they go to Uber, every time they go to Whole Foods Market, you know, that free trade and free exchange leads to more and better and interesting and prosperous things. It's on the grow. One of the weird places or one of the few places that a socialist like Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders and libertarians fit is on, um, on foreign policy. And I think it's worth it, if you're a libertarian, to say, okay, this is a place where you can start to say, look, 
We have been saying this for decades in America, that America should not be the world's policeman. America sh it doesn't know enough about other countries, and it doesn't have the right to stick its nose into everybody else's business, just like the government at home doesn't have the right to stick its nose into your bedroom or your boardroom. Uh, you know, let's let's have a conversation. About that. Yeah, I, I think his domestic policy, aside from his foreign policy, to leave other people alone, yeah. his domestic policy, though, in itself, doesn't leave people alone. No, right. I, I accept on the drug war. Right. He's also one of the few people, I, and again, Rand Paul was like this, of, in the major parties who is actually like, you know what, the war on pot is stupid. It's, it's not only a failure, it's an insult to say that, like, adults shouldn't be allowed to smoke a joint if they want. Right. Um, you know, any more than they should be allowed to drink vodka. Or it's their body. I shouldn't be able to tell you what yeah. you can and cannot do That's with your right. body, right? Yeah, and, and, I, and I don't have to pay for what you do to your body. Yeah, yeah. You know, I might want to because I'm a good guy and because we, we belong to a similar group that, like, says, okay, we're going to pull our money together. Like friendly societies yes. in the past yes. for yes. Lyndon Johnson's war on uh, yeah. drugs. I mean, yeah. war on poverty, yeah. right? And the way that they so, help and it elevated. Right. Poverty rates uh, almost went down dramatically. Yeah. Or like the regulations, uh, Rupert yeah. Report, that Reason.com put out, it's like, you're 75% poor today because of the yes. decades of uh, yeah. restrictions on totally. trade, right? Totally. Uh, in, in areas of like limited government, though, in terms of libertarian mm -hmm. meaning, it's against the initiation of force. Limited government, though, still has to have a still initiates force yeah. in that, right? But well, what do you think then? Yeah. A market of of uh, competing arbitration, competing that security. happens. You know, it's happening all over the place in terms of you know where you can enter binding arbitration and you exit the state-sanctioned court system to say, you know what, well, we have a property dispute, we have a labor dispute, we have all sorts of disputes, we're going to work it out on our own, and, and we agree to live with whatever third party we do, that's all good. I mean, libertarians, and, and I'm a libertarian, I'm not an anarchist, so I, and again, it's, you know, not be, I, I don't have a, a huge argument against that, it's just that, you know, I'm, I'm willing to live with a minimal state, a night watchman state that doesn't get in my business too much, that provides some basic goods, and services to people who desperately need them and then the rest is you know because and I think this is where libertarians and anarchists certainly agree which is that the most important parts of our lives are never going to be lived in the political sphere where we're we're voting where if I get one more vote than you then I can tell you what to do with your life or you can tell me what to do with my life the, the most important places where we live where we learn where we love are beyond politics and should be and yeah, and, and there's no government in those consensual voluntary yeah, interactions, right? right? Um, in terms of, like of limited government, the United States started off as a limited government, and I think like the small little yeah, exceptions has a lot of problems. That, I mean, right? Yeah, because I mean it was limited in some ways, and less. Would not that be a like slave, a, et cetera, so. Would not that be just a demonstration that the limited form just, just can work or constrain yeah, well, it always, it, it, There's no question. You're always pruning it back because the, it's always going to grow and get bigger and bigger. And with that, I will. Thank you so much for you. the conversation. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, I enjoyed that. That was really good. That was very uh, good and revealing in terms of um, him seeing that and acknowledging that, right? In terms of him then admitting that, yes, um, it'll continue to grow and you have to be there to prune it back, to prune back tyranny, to prune, prune back evil. I, mean, I think the best solution would be to uproot it, right, from the roots of statism and destroy it <laughs> so you don't have this problem again. So that future generations do not have to contend with this evil to threaten their lives and that of their future children as well, right? We've seen what limited government could do back then, right? This country was founded on limited evil, on seeing that it could con constrain that tyranny, creating these checks and balances unto itself. And look where we are today, right? Millions and millions of people murdered by the United States, tens of millions since uh, the 20th century, since World War II. All right, now you, now you have millions and millions of people suffering in cages for victimless crimes, All right? So I don't think this is an area in which we would want to um, give any chance or risk to bring back, All right? It started off with 1% back then in terms of taxes, and then 2%, All right? Oh, you're making a lot more money. All right, 3%, 4%, now it's nearly half our income. Right, you add up local, city, state, federal, imports, tariffs, uh, sales tax. Everything that you've bought have been taxed. Currency, fiat currency is another tax. The depreciation of the value of your currency right, means that it's difficult to save when you're already on a tight budget to begin with. What we, I guess, agree in terms of what we want freedom and the way we see it 
in terms of respect for private property, uh, for self-ownership, for voluntary exchange. That should be it. We should never compromise of principles for that. Compromising of principles is what led to the enormous Leviathan that is today, that is the United States, right? With over 900 military bases all over the world, right? It's another Roman Empire, and inevitably it'll collapse. For the same reasons that it collapsed back then, economically it'll collapse again today, right? There's no factual evidence, again, that politics has ever set anyone free, that will ever reverse the size and scope of the Leviathan. What we can do now is prepare ourselves for the transition or force his hand by uniting a large enough tribe in a city, for example, like here in Richmond, to eventually stop giving into the fear of what happens when you do not surrender your property to these extortionists. Right? You look at uh, the reason why uh, Milton Freedom created the withholding tax. That was to, that's the lifeblood of government. That's the lifeblood of tyranny. Because back then it was uh, interesting that if sometimes people will, you know, for forget to pay, uh, to pay, right? Nobody pays taxes. You're a tax victim. There's no such thing as a tax, tax payer. And if the government did not collect those taxes, uh, collect the tribute, uh, it'll collapse, right? Because some people are late. Some people don't uh, mail it out on time. And so his solution, his greatest sin that he admitted is the withholding tax. So along the way throughout the entire year, um, they'll steal from you, right? And it's up to you during around April to figure out whether they steal too much or too little, right? And that helps to sustain these unfunded liabilities. And inevitably, though, if you just have just a small like 5 10% of any given populace in that city is upping their exemptions, for example, or all together just to stop, right? To have that force, to have that willpower, that courage, it'll, we can force this collapse, right? Um, but that takes time to build a tribe. That takes time to build a community of champions of liberty. And so this will take, what, 15, 20 years, right? So there's two ways it could happen. One, that government will inevitably collapse. The dollar's lost 97% of its value. Um, it's inevitable. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a civil war or violence, right? You look at the collapse of the USSR, where was all the civil war that occurred on the Eastern Bloc of Europe? Nowhere, right? So... History tends to show it does not occur in the Hollywood myth that government likes to prop up and scare you. Again, that uh, there will be monsters out there waiting if you do not support you know, the boogeyman that is government itself. Uh, it's another way to, to control you through that fear. Um, and the second way is we can force his hand when, it, when we're ready. When we're ready for the transition for a free society and uh, to finally complete, right? Uh, on that day, we launched uh, Social Ostracism Day. On that day, a tiny few uh, minority of uh, violent sociopaths are left. Your politicians, your police extortionists, you know, they'll be begging to be left to, to come into our society. Left they uh, try to figure out what to do in the woods on their own, right? Civilization belongs to the civilized, not to the barbarians. And I'm not interested in rebooting the matrix, I'm not interested in bringing everything back to a limited form of tyranny just so my future uh, offspring or children have to contend with it themselves, right? Let's end it now. Let's abolish government. Let's abolish tyranny. Uh, let's spread anarchy and finally achieve real freedom in our lifetime, which is possible, which is possible already. Remember, anarchy exists wherever there is consent. That is anarchy. And as uh, the more people realize that and more people let go of the idea that violence will set us free, that government will set us free, anarchy continues to grow in size. And it's not something that you can ever uh, go back from or ever uh, go back against, right? In terms of like the matrix, right? Once you've been unplugged, you can't really forget uh, truth. You can't forget what, what the, the lie really was that you've been um, indoctrinated to believe. And that's what's the same with government, right? No factual evidence, again, the government has ever set anyone free. Let's not advocate for any kind of tyranny, right? Let's uh, never compromise our principles. Let's continue to universalize our values and continue to push forward and press back against the evil that is government that has robbed us of so much, that has robbed our, our ancestors of so much, and to prevent them from robbing further of the, of the future that we want to create. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video I have with Reason.com with the uh, editor-in-chief, uh, Nick uh, Gillespie. 
it's something I guess that has to come up now in the forefront of the conversation. Are we really for the free market? Do we really respect private property or other exceptions, right? Are there, you know, are, are we going to compromise, right? It's kind of time to kind of have that conversation and say, look, rather all for freedom or we're not. There's no gray position, right? Gray position acknowledges that there are black and white positions out there. You either advocate for consent or you don't, or you advocate against it, right? There's no compromise with consent. And that includes in areas in respect for private property. So I find that perhaps maybe Reason Magazine can perhaps sooner come to that uh, conclusion themselves and to stop compromising, right? Free minds don't distract them and further delude them that government will still set you free, that you can still bring back a limited form of tyranny that you can constrain. <laughs> we don't want to deal with evil in our lifetime. We don't want to deal with that anymore. Right? We're not babysitters of evil, right? We're out here supposed to abolish that sort of thing. No one should have any control or rule over anyone's life. Right? We're against the initiation of force, and that principle, that value should be universal to include everyone. No matter what title or what color costume you wear, right? It's always wrong to initiate force. And I think that should be the new platform, the new area in which Reason Magazine should start to adopt lest uh, they start getting hijacked by social Marxists who will look at this opportunity to find these exceptions, which they have with many other organizations, and hijack it, right? Like what you saw with um, a lot of interesting libertarians now advocating for Bernie Sanders. What is that about, right? Creating these exceptions allow for people to do that. If you want to be uncontrollable, if you want to be uh, f for freedom, you're going to have to cut off those exceptions so that no one can uh, steer it otherwise, so that no one can bastardize the message, bastardize libertarianism, as so many have already tried to do. So with that, I hope you guys enjoy this video with uh, Nick Gillespie. The next one I'm going to put up will be the one with uh, C4SS, and that's going to be a fun one to watch. So this is Cal Maloney, and I'll see you guys at the victory party. Take good care.